Just go on, yeah. Yes. Uh, if you remember last time we uh, wrote this theorem, it's Marty's characterization. And uh, we said that if we take a player domain and the family of uh, Riemann's fair valued holomorphic, holomorphic functions on this plane, which by that uh, we mean actually meromorphic functions. We took the standard induced Euclidean metric on the surface of the Riemann sphere. Now the family is normal. If and only if the family of pullback measures, uh, f star tau, where f is in this family, is uniformly bounded on compact subsets of u. Now, an equivalent way of saying this is that f is a normal family if and only if for each compact uh, set in our domain u, there is a constant mk uh, such that for all z in the, uh, this compact set and for all f in our family, we have two magnitude f prime z over one plus magnitude f prime z square less than or equal to mk. Now we want to prove this um, theorem. Now, the equality of the two statements comes from the definitions, definitions of spherical metric and definition of pullback metric. Now, we will work on the second statement here um, because it's easier to show that. Uh, well, spherical metric can also be taught as a pullback of the surface of the metric tau. On this, you, you, if you remember, we um, took the Euclidean metric. We, uh, we uh, wrote a metric P on this, which sends uh, points from the complex plane to the Euclidean uh, Riemann sphere. Now, if you take Euclidean metric and on tau, you can visualize spherical metric as the uh, pullback of the surface Euclidean surface Euclidean metric tau on the sphere. Now, as a side note, and as per a question of last uh, R, uh, the standard Euclidean metric on sphere, the, the distance, is actually uh, you. What you mean by distance on a sphere, in a sphere, for example, is you take two points on the sphere, you uh, find a great circle that passes from that, those two points, and you calculate the length of the portion of that great circle. Now, you can calculate this by um, using spherical coordinates and integral, or you can directly calculate it by uh, using classical geometry <coughs> methods. And if you do that, this distance uh, d tau z to w is given by 2 arc tangent arc sinus uh, absolute value of z minus w over square root of uh, 1 plus absolute value z square times 1 plus absolute value w square. Uh, now, but we, we actually don't use this uh, thing to derive our equations. Um, Sorry. It can be shown, and I believe it is done in Alfors context in this book, uh, or it is given as an exercise. The metric tau and the one we are using here, whose pullback gives spherical metric I call. So it's a rather lengthy exercise, so I won't do it. You can check Alfors book or I mean, this might be given in uh, differential geometry textbooks or context analysis textbooks. You can, most probably as an exercise or an example, you can find how it is done elsewhere. So, um, so we won't be doing 
all those details. <clears throat> what we will do here is uh, we want to show the given inequality holds if and only if every sequence in F has a normal, normally convergent subsequence. Here we note that uh, FR F takes values on the Riemann sphere. Now I want to make a few uh, reminders from the complex analysis, or rather analysis. Uh, two definitions. First of all, a family of continuous functions on a common domain, x to y, is called equally continuous. If for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, whenever zw is in x, not s, there is a typo there, uh, with distance less than delta, then the distance fz, fw, there is another typo there, is less than epsilon for all f. This means that, I mean, uh, you can, this is the classical de epsilon delta definition. So what we want is we want this inequality hold, this epsilon delta de definition hold for all uh, zw in x and for all f in the family. So this is a little bit stronger than uniform continuity. Uh, so we also give the definition of equiboundedness. F is equiboundedness if there exists a bound greater than zero such that whenever z you take a point in z and the function if in f we have the distance of fz from zero less than or equal to m. So this means that uh, image of the R set lies in a relatively compact set. Image of RF is relatively compact. It lies in a ball. So uh, I also want to remind the Arizona Ascoli theorem. If you remember from analysis, Arizona Ascoli theorem said uh, if K is a compact set in RM, and if F is an equi-bounded and equi-continuous equi family of functions on this compact set, then F contains a sequence which converges uniformly on K. Uh, now, if you look at complex analysis textbooks, there is another version of that, as we when you uh, have your setup in complex numbers and uh, your fun you take your functions monomorphic, uh, it shows that equiboundedness automatically implies equicontinuity for holomorphic functions. But we will, yeah, I mean, this this is okay. We will work this uh, version of Isaac Asper. So these are our basic tools from the concept of compactness. And we want to apply them in our setup. First, we want to uh, do the opposite direction. We want to show if the given inequality holds, then F is necessarily equibounded and equicontinuous. Then the result follows by Arzalasco theorem. So let us fix a compact set K and assume that that this inequality holds for all f in our family and for all z in that compact set. Without loss of generality, we may assume that k is the closure of an open connected set. Uh, so let gamma be a continuously differentiable curve from a, b to this uh, open connected set V. Then if you remember this spherical length of F composition gamma is given by L sigma, sigma here is, uh, is the spherical metric, is given by this integral. But then 
if you look at this inside of this integral and open it, uh, the magnitude of F compose gamma prime uh, with respect to gamma at the point F composition gamma T is equal to sigma, the value of uh, sigma at the point at F composition gamma T times the magnitude of F composition gamma's derivative T. This, is, this comes from the definition. And if you write this uh, by using the definition of spherical matrix, uh, you get this is equal to 2 over 1 plus F composition gamma T square, magnitude of it, of course, plus F prime at the point gamma T times gamma prime T. And this is this part is necessarily equal to MK because for all Z, let me just roll back. For all Z, we read, if we have this inequality, it is true for all Z, and it is true for gamma T as well. So this is less than equal to MK times gamma prime T. This means that the length of F or gamma is less than or equal to MK times, some constant times, the thinning arc length of gamma. We call that we define distance as the minimum length of such curves, such integrals. So what we have here is if we take z minus w less than delta, we can find an epsilon which satisfies d sigma f z f w and delta. So this shows equicontinuity. Similarly, you can show equiboundedness. Uh, now, since f was an arbitrary, I was ask the theorem says that our family is a normal family. For the other side, let us take f normal family f and fix a compact set in our domain. And let us suppose that the given equality does not hold on this compact set. What does this mean? This means that there are functions fj in our family such that the, this limit here, if you take, if you define ujz as uh, 2 magnitude f prime jz over 1 plus absolute value fj squared, this thing goes to zero because this, sorry, I'm not going to roll back again. This is, we, we, we assume that this is unbounded. So there is no k, this thing goes to infinity. And so this goes to infinity. But if it's normal, so at each point of p, in our, uh, in, in our domain, uh, we have a neighborhood such that if j goes to f normally on this u p, and f is holomorphic because f j's are holomorphic. But then u j converges normally on each u p, and k is a compact set, so we can cover P by a finite mean of these UPs. So actually, UJ should be bounded on this compact K, and that gives us a contradiction. So when we have Marty's characterization, we can state a general version of Montel theorem. We take a domain in the complex plane, uh, we take three points on the uh, Riemann sphere, and we suppose that F is a family of holomorphic functions taking values <coughs> from the uh, Riemann sphere minus these three points. Then we can say that F is a normal family. 
uh, normal family in the sense of the last definition. He gave two definitions of normal families. Yeah, we're okay with the second definition. Now, um, for the proof, yeah, I mean, without loss of generator, we can assume Q is, Q is equal to zero, Q is equal to one, and R is equal to infinity. If not, we can just uh, send the points P, Q, and R to where we want by, by uh, appropriate mappings. So what we are actually dealing is we are dealing with holomorphic functions in the complex plane minus zero one. So uh, it is enough to assume f is normal on any d zero alpha, and then send alpha to infinity. So uh, if you remember, we defined a metric on C minus zero one by this long expression, we will be using that metric. Uh, but if necessary, you can multiply this with a positive constant and uh, the curvature, you, you can say that, we, we can assume that the curvature is bounded above by minus four. We, we showed that the curvature was bounded about by a minus constant. We can assume that constant is minus four. four. Um, we have our f holomorphic. So uh, we derive this formula. But if you remember uh, this rho alpha a was a metric similar to but not exactly like function metric. And if you use that, uh, when a is equal to zero, one or infinity, when you look at this limit, limit of the spherical metric divided by this new metric as z goes to a, as z goes to zero, one, or infinity, we have this limit zero. Uh, so this means that we, sigma z is less than, sigma z over mu z is bounded. So uh, for all z in the complex plane minus zero one, we can say that there exists a bound greater than zero, such that sigma z is less than or equal to m times mu z. And if you write this, this is equal to uh, our uh, quantity to absolute value of f prime z over one plus f z uh, magnitude f z squared is equal to the pullback of f to the pullback of uh, the spherical metric with respect to f, and then it is less than or equal to um, f star mu, and it is less than or equal to n times this row a alpha metric on, on the disk with radius zero and uh, with, with center zero and radius alpha. Then, by Marty's theorem, we can say that f is a normal family. Uh, there is an immediate corollary. You can say that if f is a family of complex valued holomorphic functions on you, all of which omit the same two values for their images, then f is a normal family. Uh, so about the essential similarities, we have a theorem. If you take the punctured disk, the alpha, uh, d zero alpha uh, minus origin, and take a holomorphic function which has an essential similarity at zero, then if restricted to any related neighborhood of zero, 
omits at most one complex value from its image. We already said this, this was a result of uh, Kasserati wire stress theorem. Now the proof is that as an exercise, it's not an easy exercise, but it is doable. Uh, what you do is you, you can, first of all, you can read out of those of generalities, can assume that the omitted values are zero and one. And then you can show that zero is either a removable singularity or a whole of F if you assume uh, yeah, I mean, if, if uh, yeah, you assume two, it omits two values, and then you can show that zero is either a removable singularity or a call for f. For that, you can define f, f and z such that f z over n for the given function, then the family of f n is a normal family. Now, this is all for the uh, spherical metrics and curvature for now. We want to, after this, we want to define some new metrics. Uh, there are some uh, references. These are, well, first of all, uh, the second one is the textbook, that's complex analysis geometric viewpoint. Now, the mm -hmm. others are, this this is um, for history. If you are interested in history, this is the uh, paper of Rima. There is a question in the chat. Yes, I have to unshare my screen to see that. Oh, let me tell you then. Uh, is this Picard's big theorem? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I forgot to write, mention it, in, write it in the caption of the theorem. Okay. So let me share it again and show you. Okay. So about uh, definitions. If you are interested with stereographic projection, there is a book of Piman. Uh, it, it looks at different maps from a point mathematics, mathematicians for it to feel. This is the first uh, reference. And well, now it is called Riemann sphere as a historical remark. But Riemann is not the one who invented the Riemann sphere. Karl Neumann is generally the one who, paid, who is given credit for that thing. He used throughout this book. It is unfortunately it is in German. I couldn't find an English translation. So this is the first instance so uh, that people think the Riemann sphere is used in mathematics. The stere stereographic projection was known before. Uh, it is known in ancient Greek and uh, ancient Egypt times, and it was used by cartographers and astronomers for, for uh, charting, for making star charts mainly, and then uh, for making maps uh, in Middle Ages, after Middle Ages also. It was also used for mapping Earth. So these are, and also this, uh, you can add this list, one of your favorite differential geometry textbooks, I forgot to mention. So let us give a five minutes break at this point and continue. After five minutes. One. Okay. Let's continue. Now we want to define two new metrics. Uh, 
Now, what we will do is we will define the matrix, uh, find out the basic geometric properties of these ma new matrix, uh, and then mm, tomorrow we will show that, not today, tomorrow, these metrics are actually complete metrics. Uh, tomorrow, uh, well, I'm also planning to say a few words about Bergman metric, but uh, hopefully we have time for that. If not, uh, maybe we can, I mean, I also want to do maybe another class that concentrates on burden metrics only. Uh, but let us get on with this new two metrics. First of all, if you checked that part from the first, very first day, uh, we said, uh, we, I said that it is a good idea to check the uh, proof of Riemann mapping theorem. Uh, first, recall that Riemann mapping theorem says if a domain in the complex plane is topologically equal to the unit disk and it is not the entire plane, then it is conformally equal to the unit disk. Now, if you check the proof of Riemann mapping theorem, Riemann used the function, uh, Riemann mapping function. Uh, this was a solution to a certain extremal problem. You need to find the map, map of the given domain u into the disk D. Uh, the function needed to be one-to-one. -one. Uh, it needed to give a, a map given point P to zero, and it needed to have derivative of greatest possible modulus, uh, which is, say, lambda P at the point P. Now this idea uh, can be used if, even if the uh, domain you take is not topologically equal to the unit disk. Of course, some parts of the Riemann mapping theorem fall apart, but we can do a lot of things uh, without those uh, results also. So it was Constantin Karateoduri which came up with the idea first uh, time. He used the quantity lambda p to construct a metric, and it is later called Kare Theodori metric. Uh, what we do is we maximize the derivative of p uh, of the maps from u into unit disk, such that the uh, value f of uh, phi at the point p is zero, but we no longer require the maps to be injected. So let us give the definition. We fix a domain in the complex plane. We take d as the unit disk. Uh, if p is in our domain, we define uh, d u sub p as the functions from u to d, from our, our domain to unit disk, and we want these functions to be holomorphic, and we want them to have value zero at the point p. Let me check if this is this. Then the Carretero-Dori metric uh, for u at the point p is defined to be the supremum of the derivatives of all these uh, phi's at the point P, and the magnitude of the derivatives of these phi's at the point P. And that is how we define the metric. Now, if you check that, you see that the, this quantity FUC actually measures for each group, of course, the extreme value in the proof of Riemann mapping theorem. Now, of course, uh, well, since it is defined by the supremum of uh, absolute values, it is always greater than or equal to zero, if you see p. And 
also by using Cauchy estimates, you can show that uh, the value of the skeletal metric at any point P is less than infinity. So when we suppose, when we take a bounded U, bound domain, then you can take U, you can say that you use a, a subset of a disk centered at zero, it radius R, for some R positive. And if you take the map, which takes zeta to zeta minus P over two R, then this map is inside the U sub P. So we have the value of the uh, metric at the point P. This, this, is e, this was equal to the supremum of such uh, things, such uh, absolute values. This is equal, greater than or equal to uh, absolute value of phi prime at the point P. But this is 1 over 2R. And since we took R positive, this is always greater than zero. So if U is bounded, your, uh, the metric metric is always positive. But if you take an unbounded domain, things don't go as well. Now, we won't discuss what happens uh, when U is unbounded. So there are dis discussions in classical uh, complex analysis books, and uh, there are other references as well, of course. But you can show that easily. Uh, you can show that the, when you take U to be the complex domain, the value of F uh, correlatory metric at point P is identical to zero. Uh, but we want to concentrate on other things for now. Let us derive the geometric properties uh, of this metric as we did with one parametric and spherical metric and all the others. We take two domains in complex plane. Uh, we say that row one is the correlative metric on U1 and uh, row two is the correlative metric on U2. And if we define, if you take a holomorphic function from U1 to U2, then H is distance decreasing from U1 row one to U2 row two from the first space to the second space. That means that the, uh, this inequality is to H star row two Z is less than or equal to row one Z. And uh, well, proof is actually rather straightforward. You take a point in U1, uh, you set Q is equal to HP. Now, if phi is in the U2, Q sub Q, then phi composition H is in the U1 sub P. So we have this inequality. Uh, the value of creditor metric in the first domain at P is greater than or equal to uh, the magnitude of phi composed with H prime at the point P, but that is equal to phi prime at the point Q, the magnitude of it, times H prime at the point P. So what you do is you take supremum all, all, over all phi, such that, like this, and you get the uh, value of uh, Correlatory metric at the point P at the first domain is greater than or equal to the value of correlatory metric at the point Q in the first in the second domain times the magnitude of H prime P. But this is a, exactly what we want to show. Row one at the point C is greater than or equal to H star row two at the point C. So we have a corollary. Actually, we have three corollaries. If you take a curve from 0, 1 to U1, 
Uh, this curve, curve needs to be piecewise continuously differentiable. And then you uh, see that the length with respect to the second metric of H star gamma is length less than or equal to the length of gamma with respect to the first metric, first star metric. Now, we have to say this uh, at this point, but we defined predator metric, the way we defined predator metric, it's not immediately uh, possible to say that it is integrable, predatory metric is integrable on the curves. But it is constructed as a supreme of continuous functions. So this means that the metric is not continuous, but semi-continuous. So it is integrable on curves because a semi-continuous function is the monotone limit of continuous functions. So we can state this corollary, actually. So uh, there is another corollary. This, uh, this is related to distance formula. If you have two points in the first domain, then the second distance with respect to second predatory metric between H P1 and HP2 is less than or equal to distance with respect to the first predatory metric uh, between P1 and P2. So this says that predatory metric is distance decreasing, has the distance decreasing curve. And another corollary uh, if you take a conformal map, then this map is an isometry of. Uh, the first domain with respect to the, the first predator metric to the second domain with respect to the second predator metric. So conformal maps are isometries. So now the proofs can be done exactly the same way we did uh, those uh, things in for Poincare metric. It's a good exercise. Try either this or uh, Kobayashi metric. Try to be, derive these proofs for, for either Theodore metric or Kobayashi metric. Uh, then you can see the details more clear, clearly. So we won't go into details of those proofs. Uh, but we have a proposition. This is an interesting proposition. It says that predatory metric on the disk actually coincides with the point metric. So when you take your domain U as the U disk, you get nothing but the point metric. So proof is easy. Let us calculate the metric at the point P is equal to zero first. If you take a function from d, d sub zero, uh, then by Schwarz lemma, you have the, uh, derivative of, this should be less than or equal to one. So there is a type of, uh, then by Schwarz lemma, we have the magnitude of phi prime at zero, less than or equal to one. There is a typo here, be careful. So what we have is the predatory metric uh, at the domain U and point zero is defined by the supremum of T prime zeros, magnitude of T prime zeros. And since the derivatives of all those uh, phi prime zeros, the magnitude of the derivatives of all those phi prime zeros are less than or equal to one by Schwarz lemma. We have FDC at the point zero is less than or equal to one. So now consider phi z is equal to z. Then you have 
phi in dd is sub zero, and you also have the magnitude of phi at the point zero one. So what we have is we found a phi which satisfies the other side of the inequality, which is equal uh, the magnitude of phi prime at zero is equal to one. This is always less than or equal to FDC at the point zero, and it is less than or equal to one. So FDC at the point zero should be equal to zero. So then you can, uh, then you know that every conformal map of the disk is an isometry of the predatory metric. Uh, so you can change it to any other point. Uh, this is, if you remember, this is given as a corollary a few minutes ago. So we can conclude that character metric is a constant multiple of the point character. So uh, let us define another metric. This is Kobayashi metric. It is a sibling of the uh, character metric. This time, we take a point in the, the domain U and we define UD to the power P as uh, holomorphic functions from unit disk to U, to this domain U, such that the value at zero is equal to P. Then the Kobayashi, or sometimes it is called Kobayashi Rodan metric, for you at the point P is defined to be infimum of one over absolute value of phi prime at zero over all phi's in the U D to the power P family. Now, when you look at this, you clearly see that we have FUK uh, at the point P is always greater than equal to zero because we define it with the help of absolute values. But we have a proposition. We also have a proposition which says that uh, for all P in, the, in U, we have the uh, predatory metric, value of predatory metric for P is less than the value of Kobayashi metric. There's a question in the chat. I can't see the chat box. I can't access the chat chat box while I'm sharing this. Yeah, I can re read it. But what if uh, five prime zero is zero? Do we interpret one over five prime zero equals infinity? Uh, I. Yeah, there are singularities. You, you can, we, we talked about it at the, uh, at the very beginning of uh, defining, while we were uh, defining isometries and also metrics and all such things. There may be singularities. Uh, you can treat those points as undefined. And you can uh, work with those problematic points uh, one by one according to the setup. But we, 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 yeah, it happens, but we, we uh, at, at times, but we work on them and justify what it means uh, according to the set, setup we, we are using. We will look at it when the time comes. Uh, okay. So the proof is a nice little ex application of Schwarzschild now. You take a phi in the du sub p uh, family and the uh, psi in u d to the power p family. When you compose them, this is a map from disk, unit disk into unit disk. And the value of zero at the point zero is equal to zero. So we can apply Schwarz lemma uh, and see that 
this is equal to zero. But this is equal to one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, this is the same thing as uh, phi prime p at the magnitude of phi prime p uh, is less than or equal to one over the magnitude of c at the point zero. We take supremum over all phi and infimum over all, over all c to get the desired inequality. So there are typos. This should be one. So uh, when U is bounded, we always have uh, the predatory metric at the point P greater than zero. And we just said that the uh, Kobayashi metric at the point P is greater than or equal to predatory metric at the, that point. So when U is bounded, uh, Kobayashi metric is strictly greater than zero. Now, what happens when you is unbounded? Yes, when you is unbounded, it can happen that Kobayashi metric is equal to zero for some points, but we won't go into the details of those uh, really uh, too much. Let us say that if u is equal to c, you can show if the Kobayashi metric at the point P is identically zero. To show this, you can take the uh, function P R zeta defined by P minus R zeta. Then clearly P R is U D top, uh, power P or any R greater than zero. And when you let R to infinity, you can see that the Kobayashi metric reduces to zero, identically zero. So, uh, so we are usually, in the setup we will be taking u is bounded. So we won't have problems with the zeros of Kobayashi or predatory uh, But it is an interesting subject, I mean, you you should really check out uh, this. When U is unbounded, uh, sometimes the Kobayashi and Theodore metric reduces, it generates to identically zero. If U is equal to C, this is true. Uh, if U is equal to C minus a point, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't remember. but. There is a method for uh, trying to find out how much points you can omit from C without uh, making, to, to make, uh, to rescue these metrics being identical zero. So we have the same Proposition for Kobayashi metric, we take two domains, we equip them with Kobayashi metric, let row one be the first uh, metric on the first domain, row two be the metric on the second domain. If you take a holomorphic function from the first domain into the second domain, then h is the distance decreasing from the first domain to the second domain. Uh, but proof is kind of similar. We take a point in the first domain and we let Q is equal to HP. We take phi in uh, the family U1 D to the power P. Then H composed with phi is in U2 D sub Q. Uh, to the power q, I'm sorry. Uh, and the Kobayashi metric at the point q uh, in the domain u2 is less than or equal to 1 over 
H compose phi, phi prime at point C zero, that is one over H prime P, P prime zero. You take inform over all P to get the desired inequality. As expected, you also have the corollaries. If you take a gamma from 0, 1 to the first domain, it should be piecewise continuously differentiable. Then the length of the pullback of gamma uh, with h is less than or equal to uh, with respect to the second Kobayashi metric is less than or equal to the length of the curve with respect to the first Kobayashi metric. Same is true for distances. If you take two points in the first domain, then the value, the distance between uh, HP1 and HP2 with respect to the second Kobayashi metric is less than or equal to the distance between the one and the two with respect to the first Kobayashi metric. And if H is conformal, then H is an isometry of the first pair in the second pair. And we also have uh, when we are using unit disk as our domain, then the Kobayashi metric is equal to the palm metric. Uh, for the proof, we take a point in the unit disk. We already know that the Kobayashi metric uh, at the point P is greater than or equal to the Theodor metric at that point, and it is equal to the uh, Poincaré metric. So we take P is equal to zero, P zeta is equal to zeta. Now this phi is in dd to the power zero, so we have the Kobayashi metric less than or equal to one over magnitude of uh, the derivative of phi at the point zero, it is equal to one, and it is equal to the uh, Poincaré metric, the value of the Poincaré metric at the point zero. So if kd at the point zero is equal to one, and it is equal to point parametric. And you can change these points to anywhere you like. So uh, FKDP is the point parametric on the unit disk. Now, uh, we have a theorem. This is an interesting program, theorem. If we take a domain, we say that the domain U is conformally equal to the unit disk if and only if we can find a point in the domain such that the value of the Kobayashi metric is equal to value of the uh, Kaito order metric at that point. But we also require that this value is different than zero. Now, uh, the first part of the proof is easy by using these, all these propositions and correlates we uh, talked about. Now we suppose that U is conformally equivalent to D. We take it uh, conformal map for, from U to D. We take any point in the domain and what we have here, what we have is uh, the value of Kareto metric at the point P is equal to uh, H prime, uh, H star, the value of FCD at the point P, because conformal maps are isometries in Kareto metric. So the pullback metric, uh, the value at the point P is equal to uh, the value at the point P of pullback 
uh, of that metric with respect to a conformity. And this is equal to x star rho at the point P because correlatory metric is one pair on the disk. And this is equal to x star fkd again because Kobayashi metric is one pair on the disk. And this is equal to fk Kobayashi metric at the point B. Because again, conform maps are isometric C Kobayashi. This should be the other side. <laughs> so there are a lot of typos today. Uh, I couldn't have time to check for the typos. To prove the other side, suppose there is a point P such that the value of Kobayashi metric at that point is equal to value of uh, Kaiteodori metric at that point, and it is that different from zero. Uh, we want to construct or not construct, rather find a conformal map that takes U to D. Actually, finding the a conformal map is easy. Uh, the difficult part is proving that it is conformal actually conform. So uh, say Fiji is in du sub p in the family of du sub p and C J uh, be in the family of u d to the power p and we take those functions as uh, the derivative of Fij goes to the value of creditor metric at the point P and one over uh, the derivative magnitude of the derivative of C J at the point zero goes to the value of Kobayashi metric at the point P. Now we will say that this we, we will find our uh, conformal map by using Fijs, actually. But showing that they are really conformal is a bit lengthy. Now, at this point, we can say that F since Fij is, F is bounded above by 1, because uh, their Im image is lies in the unit disk, uh, by a compactness argument, we can find that subsequence Pjk converging to a normal limit P0. Now we define Hjk as Pjk composed with Tjk. Similarly, uh, yeah, this Hjk goes from D to D. So similarly, by passing to another subsequence, you can, let's call this subsequence Hr, uh, you can say that HL converges normally to limit function H0. Our matrix are strictly positive and H0 is equal to 0, so the function H0 is not constant. Now, if you remember from analysis, complex analysis, uh, when you use Cauchy estimates, you can test normal convergence of a sequence of normal functions to their derivatives. This is an easy exercise. And uh, you can easily show that when, the uh, when you have a normal convergence of holomorphic functions, you also have normal convergence in their derivatives. So we have the magnitude of h prime zero at the point zero is limit l, l, l goes to infinity of the magnitude of this composition, derivative of this composition. So if you take this limit, you see that this is equal to <clears throat> the first part is equal to the Kobayashi metric at the point P, and the second part is equal goes to uh, one over uh, the first part 
part goes to Karate Theodor metric at the point B. Second part goes to 1 over Kobayashi metric at the point B. And since these things are equal uh, at, one, at the point P, H prime 0 at 0 is equal to 1. So by Schwarz lemma, we have H0, we, we can say that H0 zeta is a rotation. It is equal to mu times zeta for some mu absolute value 1. <coughs> So if necessary, you can compose this phi as with the rotation, and we can assume that mu is equal to 1. So let us turn our attention to the sequence phi L, C L. First, observe that C minus uh, C U must contain at least two points, if not the Kobayashi metric will reduce to zero. This means that we can apply generalized Montel's theorem, and then we can see that phi L is a normal family. So by passing to yet another subsequence, if necessary, we can say that phi L converges to some P zero. And at the end, we have uh, zeta is equal to, this comes from the Schwarz uh, lemma, uh, this is how we constructed uh, the, H, the function H0. It is equal to the limit as L goes to infinity of P composed with C at the point zero, 0. And this limit goes to P0 composed with C0. Because they all both have limits. Now, since H0 is on 2 because it is a rotation. P0 must be on 2. And you can say that, also see that P0 is a non constant holomorphic function. This means that P0 takes open sets into open sets, so its image is open. Now we also need to show that its image of phi. C0 is also closed. Of course, we have to uh, say that in the relative topology of phi. So uh, we take the classical closeness, uh, we, we look at the classical closeness argument. We take a sequence in the image of uh, phi0 uh, and we, we, we take this sequence as converging to a point in U. Since phi zero is continuous, phi zero lambda j converges to a point R for some R. But we know that phi zero composed with C is identity. So we can say that uh, the zeta j converge to R. Since phi zero, since C0 is continuous, this means that phi r is equal to q, and this is saying q is image is in the image of C0. So this tells image of phi zero, uh, C0 is both open and closed, and it is also non-empty. So it must be the whole domain U because U is connected. Therefore, I'm sorry, the cat is trying to enter the room and it's making a noise at the door. That's why I'm laughing. So the image of uh, phi zero is both open and closed. Uh, so it, it is the whole domain. This says that phi C zero is onto. Now we have H0, 1 to 1. So we can conclude that phi 0 is also 1 to 1. So this shows that phi 0 is 1 to 1, 1 to 2. So it is the conformal that we want. And that is all for today. 
tomorrow we will uh, after a little after one more theorem we will show that these metrics are actually complete because we need to justify that as we did in part parametric. So okay any question references are there is something okay. I am here for for some more minutes if you have any questions or you any can questions have, yeah or you, you can, can ask always email me later on. All right, thank you very much. It's my pleasure.